Hi, I'm Old North Specialist Jackson Crawford. A fair amount has been made, uh, at least in certain circles, about the Norse roots of the story in Shakespeare's Hamlet. While it's well outside of my wheelhouse to retell Shakespeare's Hamlet to you, you can find that text pretty easily yourself, um, I thought that I would give you a quick intro to what Norse sources actually say about this character, uh, how his basic story uh, influences Shakespeare's story, which is very much its own creation out of some very basic elements in, in the Scandinavian sources, and uh, just basically what's going on when people say that Hamlet has uh, Norse sources. <laughs> So there's no equivalent of uh, any of the many fun lines and monologues and speeches in Hamlet in Old Norse. Um, there's no to be or not to be or in archaic Old Norse, at vesa, at a, a vesa. Uh, or maybe if we were more poetic, at vesa, at a vesat, something like that. But if you read or write Hamlet, and I recommend the new Kittred edition, Kittredge edition, which has some additional introduction edits by uh, Bernice Kleiman and James Lake, most of the details are Shakespeare's, including all these speeches and such. But he did build on the skeleton of a story that was retold, actually in the very same place that uh, we have one version of the story of the death of the Norse god Baldr, which is book three of the Gesta Danorum, or History of the Danes, by Saxo Grammaticus, a Danish writer working in Latin in uh, actually about the same time frame, roughly, as the Prosetta was being written in Iceland by Snorri Sturluson. Now, if you want to check out the, the story as it is uh, right there in Saxo Grammaticus' work, you can find a translation by Peter Fisher. I will warn you that it's a laborious read, and having had to read parts of this in Latin just because Sometimes it's hard to find translations, especially the later books of Saxo. I can tell you that it's not Peter Fisher's fault that it's laborious to read. Saxo writes in a really, I mean, it actually doesn't even seem that medieval, like renaissance show off -y Latin style. And the point of it is probably even more than the point of most English translations of the Poetic Edda to make you feel stupid for not understanding it. So the English translation has to reflect that in a certain sense because the Latin is so laborious, but just, just be aware, um, you know, I think Fisher did what he could with the material. So did Shakespeare actually read Saxo's account? Um, I am not a Shakespeare scholar and uh, I'm not gonna put up with people fighting about whether Shakespeare existed or not because I don't care and it's nothing to do with this. Um, plenty of people have gone about that and are more qualified to do so. I guess I'll say maybe because it seems unproven one way or the other. He could have read it in Latin, he could have read an adaptation by uh, Belfort in French, uh, which did exist or at his time or an English translation of that which potentially existed in, in handwritten draft form at, the, at his time. Now the name Hamlet is adopted from Saxo's Latin name of the character which is Amlevus. Now, what's going on is we know there was some Old Norse heroic figure associated with the Danish royal family of old. I, I, I do actually believe that it's uh, the Skjöldingar technically, which is in the same family as in Beowulf with Hrothgar. Anyway, named uh, what would be in Old Icelandic or your sort of classical Old Norse that you'll see in textbooks and, and most written editions, Amlovi. Now, there's a surprising amount of disagreement about what Amlovi means. Um, this is not a common name in Old Norse and does not fully confirm to what we would expect from an Old Norse name. The Amel part is particularly difficult to make out. Potentially, the Oath part is the same as in the name Odin. It's a word for mad, right? Crazy or angry, which would actually fit from the fact that, of course, 
in uh, so many versions of the story, uh, Amalus or, or Hamlet, or Amalus, uh feigns madness. But it's still really difficult to know what to do with the Amal. Uh, I think a kind of attractive idea is that this is the Old Norse name Olaver, which in, in another time would have been something like Anlives, borrowed into Old Irish. Um, I believe the Irish pronunciation is Auli, but in Old Irish there could have been a point where it was more like Anlaiv, um, borrowed back into Old Norse. Uh, there are a fair number of Irish names in Old Norse, like Kjartan Njal. Um, they could have borrowed this name without realizing that it was a uh, had already been a Norse name at one time. Uh, but I don't know. It's, it is a legitimately kind of questionable name. But what ends up happening is you've got Amluthi and uh, Old Icelandic or uh, classical Old West Norse. But in the Old Danish of Saxon's time, we already have a lot of vowel reduction. So this is presumably something like Amlutha with uh, schwa vowels in the unaccented syllables that would have been written E or Ash in uh, Saxon's time. And then he typically writes that is consonant, right, the TH sound in uh, then or, or the or there as TH. And then he adds a Latin A US. So we can omelet this out of what would be the Old Danish equivalent of Old Icelandic omelet. And then uh, Belferet in typical medieval or early Renaissance or indeed long lasting tradition of uh, Latin and French writers adds H somewhat arbitrarily to names. So we get uh, Hamlet and him. He also, in a very French way, doesn't distinguish between TH and T. Um, so anyway, that's where we get the Hamlet name is potentially Old West Norse to Old Irish to Old East Norse to Latin to French to English. But it is the same name. It just follows a very, very complicated path to get there. Let me give you a uh, quick word from my friends and partners at Grimfrost right now, and I'll tell you a little bit about some of the plot of Saxo's Amalus story and how that becomes, one way or another, Shakespeare's story of Hamlet. <laughs> So, in Saxo's version of the story, um, Amluvus is also the son of a dead king, Horvendilus, which is a Latinization equivalent to the Old Norse name Aurvandil. Curiously, um, Aurvandil's toe is the name of Venus in Old Norse, owing to one of the few stories we have about someone named Aurvandil in Old Norse. Uh, in the prose Edda Snorri tells us that Thor carried him in a basket across a river. Uh, Aurvandil's toe froze, and Thor threw it up into the sky for his wife to see. Uh, anyway, it's one of the few star names that we know in Old Norse, and, and definitely a strange origin story for it. The uh, same name in Old English is Eärendil, and J.R.R. Tolkien, of course, uses uh, the name Eärendil in a way uh, associated with the Evening Star in his Silmarillion. Now, Horvendilus is dead. He was king in Denmark, and his brother, so Amalthus' uncle, Fengo, probably reflecting an Old Norse name like Fengi, uh, killed him. Of course, Fengo being equivalent to Claudius in uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet. Now, Fengo has taken over as king of Denmark and married Amalthus' mother, Gerutha, which is probably the Old Norse name, Gerther, and of course, that was close enough to uh, Gertrude for that to become her name in the French and English version. But uh, Saxo has no ghost of the father that incites Hamlet to take vengeance. There's also not that much else in the meat of the play that's that close to Saxo. Although, to protect himself from being murdered by his uncle, like his father was, Amethyst does pretend to be crazy. Also, just like Hamlet kills the eavesdropper Polonius in Shakespeare's story, I guess I should say, spoiler alert, um, but if you're listening to this, you've probably seen or read some version of Hamlet, uh, potentially because you were forced to in high school and have hated it ever since. 
Uh, Amelisus kills an eavesdropper too, though unlike Hamlet, he dismembers the body and feeds it to pigs. So a little bit more raw. Um, although in, um, I guess in, in, in Hamlet 2, in Act 4, Scene 3, he does tell Claudius, um, there, there's that whole thing about, about where the, him being coy about where Polonius is, and he says, like, we fat all creatures, uh, else to fat us, and we fat ourselves for maggots. That might be kind of obliquely referring back to the story of, of Amethyst, uh directly feeding uh, the, the, the spy to the pigs. Um, in Amethyst's case, too, when he kills the eavesdropper, it's, it's after he's been berating his mom for marrying uh, her husband's murderer. Although instead of, like in Hamlet, him detecting Polonius behind a curtain, the spy, who I don't think is named in Saxo as I recall, is hiding under some straw and Amethyst stomps on it till he figures out where he is in the absence of the straw instead of through a tapestry to his side. So a little bit different, but obviously a similar scene. There's also the scene in Hamlet where King Claudius sends um, Hamlet to England with Rosencrantz at Guildenstern right after Polonius' death, uh, sending him with a letter instructing the English king to kill Hamlet. Um, now, you may remember Hamlet destroys that letter Right, he sneaks into Rosencrantz, Guildenstern stuff, takes the letter, destroys it, writes a new one, and puts that in there. Something very similar happens in Saxo's story, where um, after Amethyst has killed um, King Fango's spy, King Fango sends him to England with some toadies, and they also have a letter, although probably in runes, given that it's said to be carved into wood, for uh, the English king telling him to kill Amethyst. Same way, on the journey, Amethyst wakes up in the night, rifles through their stuff, takes out the letter, shaves what's inscribed there in runes off, and then inscribes something new. Presumably the messengers aren't literate. And of course it says to kill the messenger, the, the, not the messengers, but the toadies of, of the king rather than Amethyst. Um, that is also very, very similar to something that happens in the saga of the Volsungs, uh, where a uh, message from Guthrun to her brothers Gunnar and Hogni is altered by a Hunnish messenger to say something she didn't mean it to. So kind of a motif that runs through uh, Norse heroic stories. Another motif that actually runs a little bit through Norse heroic stories is worth mentioning here, particularly because it's also associated with the Danish royal family of ancient times as Skjöldingar, is um, pretending to be mad because you're uh, uncle has killed your dad <laughs> um, or in, and then killing your uncle in, a vin, in vengeance for your dad. Um, this has to be somehow connected to the Hamlet story, but interestingly it comes up in Iceland in Hrolf Saga Kraka or Kapahans, which by the way I've recently translated into Sagas of Mythical Heroes from Hackett Publishing Company. Uh, there we have the young uh, Hrolfdan, excuse me, Hror and Helgi who feign madness uh, at the court of their uncle Frothy, uh, before avenging uh, his murder of their father Halfdan on him. By the way, that Prince Roar is uh, is, uh, is is Hrothgar in Old English. It's just the uh, the Old Norse version of the same name. Although there's no story about him and Beowulf and Hrolfsaga Kraka, although there's a very similar story about his, I guess, nephew uh, Hrolver and creature very much like Grendel and a uh, man coming from Gitzeland or Old English Gitland to fight the monster. Look at my video about uh, that part of Rolls Saga Kraka or read my translation of Rolls Saga Kraka for more. Well people tend to say they've read Shakespeare in the same way they say they've read the Bible, <laughs> right? They've heard about these stories a lot um, and tend to think that they are uh, more boring than they are or just that there's more interesting stuff to look at. But Shakespeare's Hamlet is certainly interesting, worth reading. Um, not my favorite Shakespeare, uh, but uh, you know I, I enjoyed revisiting it for this video. Uh, of course, they also say they've read the Eddas and the Sagas in the same way. Right? People tend to think that there's a lot of stuff there that isn't, and a lot of stuff, well, they don't tend to think there's too much stuff that isn't there that is. Um, but they are, I think, more interesting things to read than people give them credit for. So check out my translations if you haven't already. If you enjoy these videos, it's more than 600 of them. Consider supporting me on Patreon. Help me keep them going.
for now from beautiful Colorado. Let me wish you all the best.